Our speaker today, speaker today is, is an old friend, uh, David Stern. Um, I've known David for a long time. We even made a trip to China um, under the auspices of the China Medical Board 10 years ago, Something like quite that. a while ago. Um, David, um, the, the, the uh, brochure or the announcement that was sent out says that David is the Vice Chair for Professionalism um, in the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Those were the good old days. Um, <laughs> I, I've learned that because a new chairman came in at Mount Sinai, a new chair of medicine, David is now not only the Vice Chair for Professionalism, but also for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, faculty affairs, finances, promotions and tenure, <laughs> junior faculty development, strategic planning and compensation, sort of, okay, and professionalism, uh, and remains an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Michigan, um, where he worked for many years. Um, David is president of the Institute for International Medical Education, uh, an independent nonprofit institute, the goal of which is to get is to get curricular materials delivered to developing countries so that countries that may have one or two pathologists in the country can have teaching materials uh, to work from. Um, uh, Dr. Stern received his uh, bachelor's degree in anthropology from Harvard, his medical degree from Vanderbilt, and a PhD uh, from Stanford, where he worked closely with Kelly Skeff in uh, medical education. Um, he served uh, as the director of standardized patients, the co-director of the doctor-patient relationship course, uh, and the founding director of the International Office for Global Reach, all at the University of Michigan. Uh, David uh, is a practicing internist with a long-standing commitment uh, to taking care of patients um, and a commitment to improving patient outcomes and to ensure the professional Perfect. behavior of physicians. Um, he'll talk to us, as you can see, reflecting on 20 years of scientific study on promoting professionalism. He'll talk to us about what he describes as his three phases of work in professionalism, the middle one of which is the one you probably know him best for, which is the psychometric part on measuring outcomes in, in professionalism. I, I gather that's part two of the three-part presentation. And, and that book, called Measuring Medical Professionalism, was published in 2006 by Oxford. Um, I, I, I think um, you'll join me in welcoming David Stern, telling him how happy we are to have you at the University of Chicago, and um, look forward to continuing interactions. David. Thanks, Mark, and, and thanks for having me here. I'm um, uh, honored to be one of the speakers uh, for this series, which is really, uh, when I got the, when I was invited, first first I was invited, and I said, of course, I'll come, and he, you said, I'm holding a seminar series on professionals, and I thought, oh, that's great. Um, I didn't realize that, I think just about everyone who has published <laughs> in professionalism uh, is either has been here or will be here in one way or another. Um, so uh, it's a real honor uh, to have been invited and a, and a great opportunity to be here. I'll, have to, I, I'll tell you that, that um, this is impressive. I it was saying to you just before uh, when this thing started that there are so many people here uh, interested in ethics and professionalism. Uh, we often, I, I do a lot of medicine grand rounds and surgery grand rounds and things like that and there, people show up because it's grand rounds and they have to. Um, uh, your commitment and interest in this is really wonderful, so um, uh, I welcome you, um, uh, really the reverse. If I'm not speaking loud enough, let me know in the back, because I can, I can project and, and will more if I need to. Um, I, was, I was thinking, and, I, and I'm reminded that most of the, of the scholars just came from a seminar, um, uh, something philosophy of uh, professionalism or f f f philosophy of ethics or... I'm reminded of, of uh, something I was strangely invited to about 15 years ago. It was the first ever, it may have been the last too, meeting of uh, the deans of colleges of rabbinic education in the United States. Um, for those of you who know much about the Jewish 
uh, education world, or, or the, there are many different sects of Judaism, the Orthodox, the Conservatives, the Reforms, and in general, it's very difficult to get two people, even within the same group, to sit down at the same table. So to have all of these people sitting around the same table, deans of the conservative and very religious groups sitting down with the very ultra-modern, ultra, uh, non-religious groups sitting down talking to one another, uh, was really interesting. And they invited me there because they were interested in uh, the development of professionalism, the development of apprenticeship, and that sort of thing in the clergy, particularly the Jewish clergy. And we got to arguing about a variety of things based on some of the work that I had done very early on and came down to the realization that, and you know, they really pushed, the, they really pushed this. And, they, and I said to them, do you care more whether one of your rabbis is good in the heart or behaves appropriately? And they argued and argued and said, we really care about the soul. We really care about what's inside. And I said, that's fascinating because you can have, in my, in my view, you can have all the evil thoughts you'd like. If you behave well, I think you're doing good enough. Um, so that's my introduction to tell you that I am a blatant behaviorist. Um, this is very different, uh, knowing the people who have spoken and people who will speak, um, very different in some ways than the, some of the people in ethics and philosophy you may have heard of. I am an empiricist. I, I, I look for data. Um, I am a scientist. I have always felt that the world of professionalism has been far too bereft of real data. And, and only with real data will we be able to um, get time in the curriculum of medical schools. Um, will we be able to demonstrate that professional behaviors are at least as important in the care of patients as cognitive behaviors. Um, and without this data, we can stand up and, and you know, dress well and look great and inspire confidence. But ultimately, we won't be able to prove our points in a world, particularly of science and medicine, where data comes first. Okay? Um, so uh, 20 years ago, I started on a scientific uh, inquiry into professionalism. And as a scientist, um, uh, let's say you, you, you could view professionalism as a, un, well, say unprofessionalism as a disease. Okay? Unprofessional behavior, that's a disease. What would you do, like any scientist with any disease, the first thing you do is try and understand something about its natural history. The second thing you do is you try and create some sort of a diagnostic test for it. If you went to treatment before you created a diagnostic test, you'd never know whether your treatments worked, right? So it really works in a logical way to do, to understand something about the condition, to find some diagnostic tests, and then to figure out what to do about it. Um, and that divides my 20 years in this field into equal parts of six or seven years apiece. Um, uh, for me, there's been a constant tension between always wanting to do something about it. When you see unprofessional behavior as a practitioner, as a care provider, as an educator, as a teacher, as a mentor, as a colleague, uh, you really want to do something about it. So I've, as a practitioner, felt that tension, but always also tried to keep my head in, okay, wait a second, if we can study this, how will we study it? Um, the studies that, that I talk about, and I will talk about some, are, are are sociological and educational in nature. Um, we don't really get the opportunity to do um, uh, in vitro studies in, in professionalism, although I've had some great conversations over the years with people about how to do them. Um, there's some great ways that you could trick people and lie to them and make them behave in certain ways and see um, Dr. Milgram, wherever you are, um, uh, uh, how people would behave. Um, we've not been able to do those. I haven't had the stomach for them, and I don't think they'd make it through the IRB anymore anyway. So I'll talk about each of these things, and then I'll talk a little bit about so, uh, where I see the future of research in professionalism going, and I'll try and do that all before 1 o'clock. Um, uh, as, as Mark mentioned, I will talk some about assessment. Um, I, I honed down, I can talk for hours on assessment if you'd like, 
Um, I honed down that piece down to very little you'll see. I'll mention a couple things about it. If you'd like to know more, we can talk for ages. Um, the, the first thing I did, um, and the reason I got into this game, was not at all because I cared about professionalism. Um, I, 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 not that I don't care about it, it's just that that's not the reason I got into the business. The reason I got into the business is because I cared about teaching. Um, I was finishing residency and decided I wanted to go on and, 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 the, and, and continue in medicine. And I wanted to be in an academic medical center. And the reason I wanted to be in an academic medical center is because the one thing I really loved was not any particular organ, um, but was that I loved teaching. And at the time, this was 88 or 89, um, you couldn't continue in teaching, of course, unless you have students. The only places you had students were in academic medical centers. The only thing that you had to do in an academic medical center other than teach and take care of patients was do research. So what in the world was I going to do research on? I was going to do research on teaching. Um, and uh, this, this, this troubled my uh, chair of medicine to no end, um, Shelley Wolf. Uh, uh, is a wonderful man, and he said you should go back and think about rheumatology, <laughs> which I did. Um, but I said I really want to. I really want to do research on education, and he said there's no NIH center for that. I don't. I can't guarantee that you'll have a career, but if you do it, uh, do it with people who are doing it well. Um, and I found my way to Stanford, um, really to study education. And my mentor Kelly Skeff there said go to the education school, learn whatever you can, have fun take the courses from the best professors, which I did, and uh, find your way into something that interests you about education. Don't do what I'm doing. He was doing improving the, the quality of bedside teaching, which is a wonderful work. And I, and I walked into the classroom of a uh, University of Chicago uh, uh, grad, and I think he was professor at the education school and also worked at the lab school, Elliot Eisner. Um, a brilliant professor at Stanford who's uh, really the heir of, of uh, much of the work of, of Dewey. And uh, Eliot, one day in his classroom, was talking about the three curricula that all schools teach. And the three things that he says all schools teach, he was talking about elementary schools, are the explicit curriculum, that's the stuff that's written in the syllabus, um, the null curriculum, and that's the stuff that's not anywhere in the curriculum. It's not taught anywhere, and if we don't teach it, people will think it's irrelevant. He's an art educator, so he was making the argument that if you don't teach art, people will learn that it has no value, negative value. And the hidden curriculum. And here I was, having finished my residency in a fellowship in general medicine out at Stanford, thinking, what in the world is the hidden curriculum of medicine. This was 91. And I realized at that time that it was probably going to be something about professional values or professional behavior or something, that what gets taught in this, uh, what I now call the interstitial space of the day, um, is uh, all about how we behave as physicians. And uh, started looking into this hidden curriculum. When I first heard it, it was from Philip Jackson, who said it's this represented by the three R's, but not the familiar ones of reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's instead the curriculum of rules, regulations, and routines of things that teachers and students must learn if they're to make their way with minimum pain in the social institution called the school. Or the Jackson was here, too. Jackson was here, too, right? Yeah? Still here. Yeah. Still here, emeritus. Right. Um, and... Um, whether it's the school or the hospital or, or the medical school, it is, it, it is the other things that teachers teach that get you to this hidden curriculum. So in my first phase of, of looking at professionalism, at trying to understand the sociology of it, I clipped on a tape recorder uh, and a couple of research assistants and started walking around the hospital following teams of uh, medicine residents and attendings and medical students uh, days, nights, weekends, um, for about six months, doing an observational study uh, of, uh, of the teaching of values. I was trying to figure out where they were being taught, why they were being taught, which ones were being taught, how they were being taught, uh, and collected these you know, two, three hundred hours of tapes, and then went back through them listening for episodes where we thought values could be being taught. 
Um, we found that they were taught um, in some interesting places. First of all, this is in a, a Q4 call schedule. Um, uh, and uh, most of the values looked like they were being taught. And this is on a per hour basis, about one an hour. But most of them are in the long and post call period. And most of them are in the evening. Okay? So most of the values are being, most of these kinds of values are being taught late at night on call. Okay? Um, and if you look at, uh, uh, at uh, how many of those are in the formal curriculum, and formal in, in internal medicine uh, is really about 50% of the day. <laughs> There's work rounds and attending rounds and chief rounds and, and, and noon conference and lectures and all that. Most of it is formal, but still, by about a two to one margin, um, values get taught in this hidden curriculum, which is walking down the hallway, it's in the elevators, it's in the cafeteria, it's in the call rooms, it's in the conference rooms, uh, it's uh, all of these other times that are informal. Now, the values that were taught in those settings, um, some of them, I think, were taught very well. Some values that we would like to be taught uh, in the profession were taught well, like responsibility and confidentiality. Responsibility is taught fairly directly. Um, this is not a new finding. This is a very old finding. Renee Fox talks about this um, uh, back as far as 1959. Did I do that right? Close enough. Um, uh, as responsibility is a key function of learning to be a physician, um, where you uh, where we tell medical students that they are responsible for every single piece of data on every single patient that walks in the door, right? They have to know absolutely everything, and God forbid the attending asks them a question, they don't know it. They know who their patients are, they know everything about them. This is something that we teach naturally as part of the way that we, uh, uh, the way that we care for patients. Confidentiality is taught uh, in a much more implicit way. Um, uh, there are some physicians here, I remember because my dad was a doc and I followed him around the hospital when I was a kid. I, I, I do remember when charts, I mean charts now, right, they're double password encrypted and on computers that only certain people can get access to. Um, they used to be back in the day. Where do they used to keep the charts? The chart rack, before the chart rack? Foot of the bed. Charts used to be at the, can you imagine charts nowadays in the world of HIPAA to have charts hanging off the end of the bed? But that's where they were. They would hang off the end of the bed. You go by and you pick it up and you look at it. Well, we teach confidentiality not because we stand up and we say there's HIPAA rules and there's laws and you have to sign. We teach it in some ways structurally. We, we teach it by making it impossible to get at the data in any other way than in a secure fashion. Okay. So I think we do those things pretty well. Some things we ignore completely, and this was, this. This is now old data. This is 19, this is 10, 12 years ago. But some things that I think we ignored. Um, I, uh, then, public service and self-policing, two values of the profession that are fundamental values of professionalism in medicine, uh, which were completely ignored, public service and self-policing. I would say in the last decade, public service has really come to the fore in other places in the curriculum. And self-policing is still almost entirely absent, um, even though it is a fundamental characteristic of professions, and I mean professions like medicine, law, clergy, uh, any of the professions, not just medicine. The whole concept that we are self-regulating um, is a real challenge. And did I see there's one of the, somebody's talking about self-regulation. Mm -hmm. Someone coming up is talking about self-regulation. It's a wonderful thing because it's a, it's a huge gap in, in, in what we're doing. In, uh, in making sure that we maintain our <laughs> professional stance. And then some things I saw were frankly uh, completely inhibited, uh, taught as the reverse of what we would like. Um, and the best example of that is that we espouse, we talk about interprofessional respect. Oh, yeah, we work in teams and all of this stuff. Um, and that was frankly seen more in the breach than in the, than in the practice. And, uh, just an example, there's, and, and, I, and I have lots and lots of them about doctors disparaging nurses and, and other people, but here's a, here's a nice one I heard in Morning Report about internists um, dissing on surgeons. Well, you know what they say about surgeons, that they've seen one, they've clearly seen it happen. If they have two, they have a lot of experience with it, and if they've got three, then they've got an extensive series, right? Um, 
So what I learned in, in, in listening to these tapes and watching professional values being um, taught uh, in the context of clinical medicine um, was a few things. Number one, these are rare events. Um, it doesn't happen often. It's maybe once an hour, and you really have to be listening for it, and you've got to be there. And the second is that when people demonstrate their professional behavior, um, it is in a specific context, and that context is most often one in which there is some kind of conflict and you watch them resolve it. Um, the, about this time, a colleague of mine at Univers University of Toronto, Glenn Regeer, invited me up to, to give a talk and he said, tell me, he said, you can talk about anything. I said, how about I talk about what the ideal assessment tool would be for professionalism? And he said, that'd be great. I said, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> I still don't know what the ideal assessment tool is for, for, for professionalism, despite years of looking at it and writing books and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I said, you know, I, I may not know what the ideal assessment tool is, but I know what the characteristics of that tool would be. That is, that they would assess professional behavior in context, that they would watch people, that it would be able to observe people resolving conflicts. Um, because it's easy to say, I mean, it's easy for all of us today to stand up and swear to the Hippocratic Oath or some other list of values that we want to, that we want to behave in that way um, because it's an abstract list. Are you going to be honest today or, or dishonest? Well, that's easy. I'm going to be honest. Are you going to be efficient today or inefficient? I'm going to be efficient. But if I ask you if you're going to be honest or efficient and I put you in a real-world context, Sometimes you'll choose one thing and sometimes you'll choose another, okay? And it's the nature of that decision that I would love to get at as someone who's trying to study how people make these decisions and the kinds of behaviors that they have. Um, I am not the first person to say this. Um, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. If you want to know whether someone is behaving professionally or not, professionally, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, put them in a stressful situation, challenge them, make it real life, um, and you'll begin to see the character of that, character of that individual. Now, I, I, I used a couple of words that, I'm, that make me very nervous. One of them is character, and the other is professional and unprofessional. Um, about this same time, uh, along with colleagues from the University of Toronto, particularly Schiffer Ginsburg, uh, we began to talk about the stigmatization that occurs with the word professional and unprofessional and the concept of character, um, which is not our, my business. I, there are people who do that far more than I do. Um, but for many reasons, m m uh, many of us in the world of measuring professional behavior have tried to adjust our language to talk about lapses in professional behavior as opposed to unprofessional behavior or unprofessional character. The reasons are many. Number one, professional character sounds like a fixed characteristic. Number two, professional behaviors, you know, you are, or unprofessional, um, again, is a label that sticks. There is no gray zone. And both the observational work that I've done, and I think everyone, your own personal experience will tell you, that we all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Nobody should be expected to be perfect. We all have lapses in professional behavior. Things that on retrospect, I wish I wouldn't have slammed the phone down on that nurse at 2 o'clock in the morning when she called me for a Tylenol order, which was really idiotic, but I still shouldn't have hung up the phone on her. But I was tired, and I was upset, and I was whatever. Um, so thinking of lapses in behavior rather than unprofessional character or unprofessional behavior is both helpful for me as an individual thinking about it and also destigmatizes it so that we can begin to talk about it. Right? 
So how do you get at those, how do you get at people's um, grappling with these kinds of, of behavior, uh, grappling with these, 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 uh, these values in their head? How do you get them, how do you watch them do it? How do you watch them evidence their professional stance? Um, well, you can do what I did. You can observe them. Uh, you can observe the results of these behaviors. I'll show you about how to observe the results of these behaviors, the outcomes of behaviors that you might do. You can observe the actual behaviors themselves, which is, again, what I did in this observational work. You can simulate behaviors. That's uh, standardized patients. You can perform surveys of those behaviors, ask people uh, how you might behave in certain situations, or have you done this, or will you do that, or have you seen these things. Um, and then you can ask questions though, about the behaviors. A seven-year-old boy uh, is on his fourth round of chemotherapy. All hope is lost. Um, the parents want to take the child home. Uh, you want to do further chemotherapy. What should you do? A, let the patient go home. Uh, B, sign them out AMA. C, call the police. D, you know, chain them to the bed. Uh, there's a, there's a multiple choice question modified from the National Board of Medical Examiners. <laughs> actually, it actually is a modification of a real question that they gave me. Actually, I'll tell you, that's a quick story. For, for, for a long time, and people at the National Board, um, first of all, they're, they're, if you don't know them, they're brilliant. Um, they, they, are, they're, they, they really know their stuff. The questions that they ask are quite good at getting at what they want to get at. And um, at these national meetings on assessment and, and, and medical education, they're, they're there. I hang out with them sometimes. And I used to have these long arguments about whether you could measure professionalism using a multiple choice exam. And uh, we argued about it for years. And finally, Susan Case, who is now the head of the National Board of Legal Examiners, um, uh, said, said to me one day, well, take that case of the chain the kid to the bed, right? give it to 16,000 students, which is how many they give it to every year. And she said two things. She said, first of all, some people are going to answer that question, chain the kid to the bed, OK? And then it's not going to be a mistake, OK? Half the people that say it are going to think, I'm doing so well on this test <laughs> that this is a stupid question, and I'm just going to circle that anyway just to show them. And the other half of the people are going to actually think it's the right answer. And I think you want to know who both of those people are, right? So uh, multiple choice questions, as I say, are, are, are a good way to potentially catch outliers, um, but not a great way to measure professionalism in general. I'm not going to talk about all these different ways to measure professional behavior, but I will talk about two um, just to show you some of the data that we've collected and presented over the years. Um, one of them is what I call administrative data. And these are the results of behaviors. And the other is faculty evaluations, which is observations of behaviors. Um, the first is administrative evaluations. And the original data collection that we did on this, although it's been validated in a couple of different settings since then, was um, because I was in this business and uh, sitting in with the, is anyone here a clerkship director? No clerkship directors. In third year clerkships in medicine, the clerkship directors routinely get together for lunch once a month at most medical schools. And they sit around and they talk about problems that are going on. And then they chat about a few students. And it's usually about March or April of the third year when the clerkship directors are getting lunch and about to sit down. And they say, oh, you heard about Joe Smith? He's on my service. And they say, oh, yeah, he was on my service you know, two months ago. There's something weird with this guy. <laughs> and then they all sit down and they say, wait a second. There's someone in the March or April of the third year of medical school, and we are just now sitting down talking about this person. My discussion with those individuals was, wait a second. We've just wasted your time, this kid's money, and a lot of effort on not finding someone sooner. So there's got to be something that we can do to find students earlier than the end of the third year or the fourth year, because at least we give them a chance to remediate, or if we don't remediate, at least we give ourselves a chance to dismiss people. Because once you've found a student at the end of the third year, there is virtually no way you're going to dismiss them from medical school. So I took an entire class of students at the University of Michigan, um, because Michigan likes to test the heck out of their students and, and keep all the data. 
Um, so I took a whole class of entering students from 1995, and I asked what predicts professional behavior in the clinical years three years later. So take students who are just enrolling and ask what, what makes a difference three years later. First of all, there was absolutely nothing from the admissions packet that made any difference. I went to the dean at the time and I said, if you want to save money, fire the admissions director, use the MCATs just like you're current, and, G and GPAs like you're currently doing, and there's no way that you can, I can show you that you're going to get a better class than you currently have. Um, there was absolutely nothing, and we looked at, I promise you, everything. Um, we did a qualitative analysis of admissions essays. We looked at who did sports. We looked at who had a parent with illness. We looked who, at who had a personal experience with illness. We really looked for just about everything we could, hoping there was something there and found nothing. What we did find is that in the first month of medical school, uh, uh, two things happened. Number one, their students, everyone's required to get immunizations. Uh, 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 tetanus, flu, MMR, uh, hepatitis B. Four immunizations, um, and you're required to report it to the dean, to the student affairs office. Um, even if you didn't get it, even if you refuse to get it, you still report that you didn't get it, okay? Some people reported it and some people didn't. Uh, there's no real penalty for not reporting it. The, the school can't hold you accountable in any way. In addition, students are required, and this was the process at the University of Michigan, to complete course evaluations for every course. A quarter of the class at a time would be required to fill out. Nobody's, nobody had to do it, but some students did it and some students didn't. And it turned out that students who, got their immuni who documented their immunizations and students who, got their, who, who filled out their course evaluations were three years later less likely to be identified as, quote, unprofessional by faculty. Now, this was fun. Because, because then you have to say, why? I mean, is it just because neurosis is good? Which <laughs> it is. Uh, I, 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 did a, I helped the surgeons to create an evaluation form for, on professionalism for surgery students. And one, thing they, one item they wanted on there was good soldier. You know? You follow orders. You do, right? We, we bubble in the circles in the multiple choice things with a number two pencil without any stray marks and completely, right? Um, that's, that's actually a good thing about being, I mean, I, I'm a general internist. If I don't follow up on every lab test, if I don't call every patient back, bad things happen, okay? So compulsivity or thoroughness is probably not a bad thing. Mark. Um, I, I'm going to turn my back a little bit. I, I, I have a, a, a colleague here at the university um, who says that, um, th that, that the admission standards or the se selection standards uh, in industry are, are so much better than they are, uh, let's say, in medical school. That, that if industry is looking for certain kinds of character traits or personality traits, uh, there are very well-validated instruments to, um, to assist them in, in making those kinds of choices at the middle to high levels, and, and that it, they can't afford to be wrong too often. And so psychologists and sociologists have validated many such instruments. They're quite different from a standard medical school application. And he wonders why we are so far behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're looking for whatever, empathy, compassion, responsibility, um, compulsivity, I mean, I mean whatever, you, whatever those features right. are, that you think are desirable, he says there are ways to do that, and there are groups doing it currently, but that the medical education line has not been part of, of that process. So are there any medical schools who do it better than others? Yes. Yes. Um, there are now, um, I think. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I'll mention this again at the end of the talk. We talked about it at the beginning. You've got somebody who's applying to medical schools over here and has experienced this. The, um, there's something called, so let me, uh, a little background first. Um, I, the reason that we are so good at measuring knowledge is because the National Board and others have learned how to ask really good questions and biopsy knowledge base 500 times yeah. using really good questions that differentiate levels of knowledge. And because you sample enough, you're able to actually get gradations of this construct 
called scientific knowledge, okay? which I think they do a pretty good job of. About uh, 20 years, 30 years ago now, um, uh, Ron Harden uh, out of Scotland and a, a number of other people um, developed what's called the OSCE, the Objective Structured Clinical Exam, a multi-station exam looking at mostly communication skills. Um, and in any measurement, there are always three types of variants. Um, the case, the student, and the examinee. There's always three sources of variance. And it was his view that if you eliminate two sources of variance, you'd be left with the student variance, which is what you're looking for. So all you have to do is standardize the case and standardize the evaluator. And you get yourself a good assessment of even something as potentially variable as communication skills. And that's precisely what we've done over the past 30 years. I don't know how much OSCEs are in use here at University of Chicago. Yes, nodding of heads. Um, uh, they usually, it usually takes about eight stations. Uh, students pass from room to room to room. Patients, are, individuals are trained to act as if they are patients. Students go in and interact with them. They're graded on a variety of scales. The, the patients are trained to act in exactly the same way with every student. They're trained to grade the students in exactly the same scales. They are, uh, and, and this is a very valid way of measuring communication skills. Um, I've often said that measuring professional behavior is more like, uh, more like uh, accounting than rocket science. Um, it's, re it's really a sampling issue. Again, if you can sample with enough discreteness in the domain, you might be able to get it. So what are we doing in admissions? They took the idea of the OSCE for communication skills and professional behavior in medical schools and took it to a pre-medical setting. Huh. So uh, uh, um, uh, Kevin Eva, sorry, I forgot his name. Kevin Eva and Jeff Norman at McMaster developed a multi-station admissions examination. Eight stations you did? Six stations? Seven stations. She did seven stations. I was just talking beforehand. She did the multiple medical interview for admission to a medical school. It's happening more and more around the country. It was a huge conversation at AMC this year, I heard, uh, with good reason. It is a multi-station exam of communication skills. Communication skills overlaps with professional behavior in many ways. Um, I, I usually say communication skills are the means through which professional behavior is enacted. That is, if you can't communicate professionally, no one's going to perceive you as professional, right? So um, this multi-station exam uh, is, if you count doctors' hours and time at, you know, whatever, $200, $300 an hour, whatever we get paid, depending on if it's Medicare or Medicaid or Blue Cross, um, uh, the uh, cost of this is not substantially more than the cost of the of this sort of standard admissions process where various faculty members meet with students. And in the Canadian example, and they've done it in a bunch of schools now in Canada, it's predictive of the equivalent of the USMLE Part Two clinical skills. Hmm. Okay? It predicts whether students are going to be good communicators or whether they're going to be able to communicate. Now, now that's a better thing. Um, and What's still unclear to me about it is, it is yes, it's picking up professionals. I'm sorry, yes, it's picking up communication skills. Wendy Levinson is thrilled. Um, the the question is whether it also picks up on people's um, propensity to behave professionally when under stress. Um, this is my Hippocratic temple of professionalism. Um, uh, it, professionalism is is, in my view, and this is a definition for the purposes of assessment. It's not for any other reason than assessment. Um, is based on three foundational elements that you just absolutely have to have without which you cannot be a professional. Um, clinical competence, um, communication skills, and ethical and legal understandings. You know, you, 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 you can't practice as a physician unless you have these things. I mean, that you would never be a professional without them. There's Mother Teresa was, may have been a, a, a wonderful, selfless. She may have been a saint. She may be a saint. She's not a saint yet, right? She is a saint. She may be a saint. Um, she is a saint. She is a saint. <laughs> Sorry. She is a saint, but she's not a... But I don't know that she's a professional because she doesn't have a knowledge base that makes her fit into the category of professional as we talk about professionals. So it's based on these foundational elements upon which are built some principles that we look for. 
And I have four up here, but you could have six. You could have two. Different people cut them up in different ways. Okay. Um, let me talk quickly about uh, faculty evaluations because that's that's also another thing that we found that's got some good predictive validity. Um, and and then I'll, I'll I'll finish up quickly. Um, one of the things that we did is looked at what faculty think about students, and and this was some work that I did with Maxine Papadakis and John Velosky. Uh, Maxine's at UCSF, John's at Jefferson, all schools that keep all of the records on all their students, which is why we selected those schools. Um, and we identified from the Federation of State Medical Boards sanctions for unprofessional behavior from graduates of those three medical schools. This is tip of the iceberg behavior. This is really bad stuff. You lose your license for it. Fraud, sexual abuse, uh, um, serious misconduct. This is not malpractice. This is not technical malpractice, okay? This is not uh, wrong site surgery, leaving a sponge in. This is uh, really unprofessional behavior. And we selected two controls for each case and then went back into our records as far as 1964 um, and looked for any grades or indications or evaluations that might indicate professionalism. And what we found uh, was this. Uh, it didn't matter if you're male or female. Uh, Knowledge does make a little bit of difference. The population attributable risk of one on MCAT scores. Um, and uh, fail, passing or failing courses, again, was significant. So there is a knowledge component. A minute ago I said a foundational element of professionalism is knowledge. I also think another one is communication skills. Okay? If there was a measure that we had in here for communication skills, I think it likely would have come up as well. And I think. Uh, Again, the work of Wendy Levinson and Deb Roder would, would confirm that, that communication skills are another reason. They talk about it in terms of malpractice, but I think it's also probably true in terms of unprofessional behavior. But the real thing that came up was unprofessional behavior during medical schools. And this sent a shiver through the spines of deans at, at, at the AMC meeting uh, when, when we started talking about this. Because what this says is that behaviors of medical students in medical school can be predictive of loss of licensure years later. Um, and that's a scary thought if you're a dean, uh, and letting people pass through the way that we had been, not anymore, for many years. The kinds of professional behaviors that we saw th um, that were particularly predictive, um, here they are. The big ones are right here. Irresponsibility. Um, remember this uh, uh, thoroughness, attention to detail, all of that stuff. Um, we think this is probably the same concept that's coming through, uh, not following through. And a second one, which I didn't show you some other data on, which I think is very important, which is the diminished capacity for self-improvement. These are two characteristics of students, um, not following through, being irresponsible, and uh, a diminished capacity for self-improvement that look like they are predictive of, in the future, being, losing your license. This data has been very helpful to, to student affairs deans uh, at medical schools around the country because they can begin to say, look, you know, I, I called you in here once before to tell you this kind of behavior towards your colleagues or towards your nurse, towards nurses is inappropriate. Uh, you said you were going to correct it. You haven't. You're back again. You fall into this category of diminished capacity for self-improvement. We're very concerned that it may lead to loss of license. You may do something that really hurts patients. So what did we learn as part of this approach to assessing professionalism? The first thing I learned is that testing is treatment. Um, testing, uh, identifying what is important, does set expectations. Um, simply by saying, guess what, folks? We really care about this stuff. Here's the stuff we care about. Um, particularly the people who are really good anyway are going to behave the way we want them to. The second thing, uh, and, and we do that in other ways as well. So we set those expectations in white coat ceremonies, in orientation se sessions, in mission statements. We do that all the time. The second thing um, is that students always learn to the test. So if you start testing it, students will start behaving in a way that you'd like them, excuse me, to behave. Right? Um, and that's why I think, uh, that's how I ended up in this, uh, uh, you see I like things in threes. Um, expectations, experiences, and evaluation. I also like alliteration. Um, uh, that three ways to promote professionalism are number one, to set expectations, to talk about them, to profess, as Matt Winnie would say, um, 
uh, to evaluate, because evaluation is to teach. Um, and the third way is through experiences. Um, and if you ask me what's the best way to measure for the purposes of rewarding people, I would say you probably should ask their peers, because peers know best. If you ask me what's the best way of identifying people who are really at the low end and should be dismissed, I'd say it really doesn't matter because they get picked up on pretty much anything that you do. Uh, they're really so egregious, everybody knows about them. It's just a matter of documenting and dismissing. And this is true for medical students or residents or what I'm doing now, which is with faculty. Faculty who misbehave, misbehave in a variety of ways. It's not hard. It's just, uh, it's just accounting. Um, and finally, the people in the middle. What do you do to promote professionalism for people, sort of the whole rest of us in the middle who usually act well, but occasionally we lapse? And the answer, in my view, from that is, is experiences. Um, and what do I mean? Well, there are some formal experiences that we create for students and trainees and practicing docs, um, lectures and seminars like this one, doctor-patient courses, standardized patients, um, experiential learning. Um, and I'm going to focus on that last one because I really think it's one of the most important. Um, the reason I think it's one of the most important is that I did a study funded by the Gold Foundation a few years ago with seven schools, uh, I'm sorry, with 20 different medical schools, over 1,000 students, and we asked them, uh, what promotes humanism? What is it that happened during your career that promoted humanism? And what they said, and this is in order of importance for them, personal experiences with illness, getting to know patients, participating in the care of terminally ill or dying patients for those in, in palliative care, positive role models, volunteer experiences, and international experiences. Now, what's common about all those things? Um, again, the Gold Foundation actually had a, had a symposium here in Chicago about four years ago. Um, and we invited schools to submit to us things that they thought were, they were doing that promoted humanism. And the three common themes in that were that each of the kinds of activities that promote the kinds of behaviors we're looking for do these three things. Number one, it puts doctors in situations that require you to, require you to see things from a different perspective, to walk in the patient's shoes for a mile and see what that really feels like. The second is that it allows for time for reflection. And the third is that reflection is mentored. Okay? You can't do it well with only one. Um, uh, I used to run Global Health at Michigan. If you just send students to uh, Ghana for a month and send them to the OB ward and there are women two to a bed, lying on the floor, dying and bleeding out, they will say, what a horrible place. I never want to go back. God forbid. I'm glad I was born in America. And that's how they walk out of it. If they don't have the opportunity to reflect on it and that have that reflection as a mentored experience, then um, the experience fails. The really good ones do all of these. And you guys probably have either done some of these or are running these things or have these things already. Um, a couple of quick examples of these kinds of disorienting situations. International health, I think, is one of the best. I think it's one of the reasons students like it. They, they used to come back when I ran these programs and they'd, they'd look me in the eye after like four years of medical school at the University of Michigan and they'd say, I got it. I, I understand what it is to be a doctor now. It's not about the technology or the this or the physical exams or the histories, the lapses, whatever. I sat there with the mom of a kid who was hit by a lorry and uh, you know, clearly going to be brain dead. They tried to hyperventilate the kid to save us. All I did was sit there all night and hold her hand, and it was an awesome experience. I get what it is to be a doctor. Right? You, you don't get to have that so much here. Sometimes you do. Um, Another disorienting experience can be palliative care. It's very hard for students. But as you saw from the survey, they get great benefit from it. And a third, just as an example, um, Mount Sinai has a visiting docs program. We have doctors who carry a black bag and go visit patients in their homes, care for patients who are homebound um, from 79th Street to 125th Street uh, in Manhattan. Um, and students go along, and it's really the most incredible experience for everyone because it is disorienting. You, you, you see patients not in your office but in their home. Um, 
here's my, uh, uh, Benit's gone. I've used this slide for years because it's a great picture of what a small group looks like. Um, but it happens to be a small group here. I don't, I don't see David. He's not here. No. He's not here. Uh, tell him he was seen. Um, but reflection and mentoring can be done in a variety of ways, and there's some really interesting stuff that's going on now. You, again, you may be doing some of these. Mindfulness work, narrative medicine, appreciative inquiry, reflective practice. These are all things that, in my view, promote the kinds of values we're looking for. So I talked about four things. It's a little bit about natural history, a little bit of diagnostic testing, a little bit of what I think works to promote professionalism. Let me tell you where I think this world is going in terms of the research on professionalism. The, the really promising places for those of you who are looking for, for, for good research work to do. The first one is exactly what we talked about. Can this multiple mini interview predict professionalism? I don't know yet. I'm not convinced. It certainly gets communication skills. Whether it's getting at professionalism, whether it could get at professionalism, I'm not sure. Um, but great work to be done. The second is something I haven't talked about, but, but hopefully I've bitten around the edges of it here enough for you to realize that I care enough about it, is this concept of identity development. Students, as they go from being college students to doctors, have to make a transformation. And they make a transformation from not doctor to doctor, so this, this professional development. They're also making a personality development from adolescence to adults. And there's an intersection that happens here. And sometimes, hopefully, people, ideally, you would have people mature into adults and then layer on a professional identity. I think, I have no data, but would love to see what happens to students who do not complete personality development and then try and layer on a professional, care, a professional uh, uh, identity on top of that. It's like building a, a house on a weak foundation. I'm concerned that students who are still immature and then try and act like a doctor may be in real trouble. Um, the psychologists and psychiatrists in medicine really need to bite into this. Uh, and I really wish they would because I think we can start to track and, and evaluate students in terms of where they are in terms of identity development and, then I, and, and measure them where they are in professional development and begin to look at that intersection. Um, the next aspect of that is what is the effect of mindfulness or narrative or appreciative inquiry on this process of professional identity development? Can we promote it through the use of those tools? Um, Remediation, what do we do with these people once we find them? And finally, um, a back to context. Are there environments that promote professionalism? Are there, uh, back to Milgram, um, are, there, are, there, are there places, are there spaces that we could create um, that would engender the kinds of behaviors we're looking for? Um, you know, I, I still see the, the world of practicing either students or residents or, or practicing physicians as having this group of amazing, well-meaning, morally f set uh, individuals I, at the highest ends of professionalism who are our role models, who are our guides, who we aspire to become. Um, uh, and they are 10, 20, 30, 40 percent of the doctors out there. And there's one or two percent who are really bad and probably shouldn't be doctors. But the vast majority of us in the middle, I put myself there, um, if we're put in the right environment, if we're put in a place that promotes the kinds of professional behaviors we're looking for, are likely to behave in that way. And if you're put in a horrible environment, they're likely to behave in not so much that way. Um, can we think about what it would look like to have a hospital that promotes professionalism, that promotes the kind of humanistic behaviors we're looking for? I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> Question: If you have any data on the 20, 25 percent of physicians who are foreign medical graduates, right? So some of the things that you've made, comments you've made, might not apply to them. Uh, specifically, one of them about about the professional identity. Actually, they go to medical school quite a lot younger than than medical students do in the United States. And sometimes those people have, our my limited experience, have a lot of embodied ideals of professional behavior that our medical students here don't have. So. Uh, where do you, what do you, what's your commentary on that? So, um, 
The first time I looked at the National Practitioner Data Bank, which is the federal registry of, 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 uh, mal uh, of uh, lawsuits and things against doctors, um, I sorted them by profession unprofessional behavior versus malpractice, and then looked at the medical school of origin. There are some, there are some non-U.S. medical schools that are far overrepresented in that group. Um, there are a couple in Mexico and a couple in the Philippines in particular, um, where I can tell you that the rates of, uh, of misconduct are not 1% of the total physician population, but more like 10 or maybe even 15% of all the graduates coming from that school. Uh, I did a small study once. Um, it had some methodological issues, but the fundamental data ended up being pre-published in the Hartford Courant as a news article. Um, there are some medical schools that graduate higher and lower percentages of students with unprofessional conduct, even within the United States. Um, probably, probably true. The intersection here is hard to think about because there is both a communication issue and potentially a professional behavior issue. Um, it's a great area for more study um, because of the large percentage of U.S. physicians who are from international schools and whether those physicians are and in what context adopting uh, the norms of behavior that might be perceived as more professional in the, in the U.S. You have data on people who have been out three, four, five years to see whether life experience, the kind of sort of deliberative decision to go to medical school rather than, gee, this is just what uh, I've been flowed into all my life. Um, and any of those things um, predicts, one hopes, uh, yeah. a, a, a better cohort. It harkens back to this other question about, about uh, other schools. It's going to take a multi-institutional study to do that because there's not usually enough students at one institution to figure it out. I can give you a little bit hint of some data. Um, that's actually from Sinai. I, I knew about it before I even moved there. They have a program called HUMED, Humanities and Medicine. They admit people to medical school after their first or second year of, of, of college and tell them to go major in humanities. Don't worry about the sciences. Don't take the MCATs. We'll, we'll take care of it. We'll, we'll, we'll brush you up on that in the year before. Those students traditionally do worse in the first two years of medical school and then outshine everybody else in the third and fourth years. They end up at the top of the class. It, it, is that because they're smart and they were smart enough to get into the program early, uh, again? Or whether they really have the interpersonal characteristics that make them really super when they hit the wards and start talking to patients? It's not, I'm not sure. Yeah. I have a question about your methodology. Um, yep. With the, the students and um, with these data about the doctors falling out, it looks like you're looking at the 1%, the tip of the iceberg, and I think that there's, there's good reason for that. I was interested in your gold study about the medical schools themselves. Yep. You were looking at the opposite. You were looking at what promotes humanism. Right. Did you ask the, the, the more traditional question for your data sets, well, what stopped humanism? What, was, what, what squelched it? What were the th reasons? Um, I mean, because that would get at the, what you just mentioned about Mount Sinai. Now you... Now you um, now, I'll have to go back and look now. I, That's the more interesting question, given all the rest of your data sets. Um, I'll tell you the, only, the, the piece of data that I'm... I, I don't think we did, um, but I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what I know from um, a study that was done a bunch of years ago. It was published in the New England Journal about student narratives on professional behavior and um, bad role models um, were seen as bad and good. Um, they were bad because they, uh, they demonstrated these unprofessional behaviors, but they were good because they inspired students to behave never like that guy. Well, that's right. if they don't succeed. But if they right. share the department, it looks successful. Uh, they still, the students still said, I never want to be like that. I may be the chair of a department, but I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to treat students like that. That's, um, uh, I'll remember his name in a few minutes, uh, Ed Emery. Somebody else will remember before I do. Yeah, question. Um, so, in, in terms of professionalism and the development of medical students and residents, yeah. um, as you're well aware, there are some external um, uh, 
regulations, specifically hours regulations, that are coming into play. And my particular question to you is about how you think that affects professionalism in terms of the specific context, as we know professionalism is contextual to some extent, right. uh, in which residents are now uh, moving more towards shift work, frequent handoffs of patients, and how you right. think that affects their professional development. The problem that it the, co the problem that it causes, it, 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 and it's not, it's just a worsening of the of the problems that have always been there, is that you can't be around 100% of the time when you have a patient in the hospital. So what does that do for the development of responsibility? And that's the key value that I think is at challenge here. Um, so as I said, it's a it's a dilemma between two sometimes equally worthy values. So here's here's responsibility, and on the other hand is self help okay or or regulation maybe maybe you want to not take ownership of it um, but uh, getting sleep and uh, and taking responsibility for patients and it's just really bad you know because there have to be so many handoffs so how do you engender how do we how do we train to responsibility when in that context one answer is you don't and you won't and now instead of like I felt on my first day of internship, suddenly I'm responsible. You may not feel it until the first day you're out in practice, which is really scary, but maybe in fact true. The first time you really have responsibility for, wait, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm off this weekend. Who's, who's going to see my patients? And how am I going to make sure these things get followed up? And what if I'm sick? And, and you know, all of that stuff. Um, so one thing is it may delay it. The other, and this is my optimistic primary care general medicine view um, is that the hospital's never been a place for continuity and uh, of care in any way. So continuity should be in the outpatient setting. So I would say more exposure to outpatient settings, continue to do the inpatient work, but understand that when you're in the inpatient setting, you're going to see different doctors. And when you're in the outpatient setting, it's your responsibility to go see your patients when they're in the hospital. So one of the things that we're doing at Sinai right now we're struggling with is this discontinuity of care from the patient's perspective as they move from place to place to place. And uh, I just instituted, because I can now, a new policy um, that primary care providers must go visit or call their patients when they come in the hospital. And that's, I, I, made, that a, I made that a rule for the faculty first, and then I'm going to make it a rule for the residents next, um, that either you or someone from your team has to come visit your patient in the hospital when they're there so that the continuity becomes, the responsibility becomes related to your outpatient care and the, the discontinuity is handoffs or the discontinuity is handoffs. Let's, so, so be it. You, at least we won't lose the, the value of responsibility in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>